uh, I started at St. Jason's uh, just, just recently, just last May. Um, so I thought, and I'm kind of new to the small talk community at large, so I thought I'd just tell you a little bit uh, about where I came from. Uh, so I graduated uh, college in about 2001, and I was extremely fortunate to have my first uh, job coming out of college to be in small talk. And uh, this has really served me well because while I did get to work on uh, J Wars with Donald McQueen for, for many years, and we had a wonderful time, uh, just the nature of defense contracting, which is the area I was in, I, was, I had to pop around and do a lot of different stuff. Uh, and so that experience that, you know, coming out of college and, and learning small talk and uh, really being able to view software development uh, as a construction activity in the, in the way that small talk typically views it really served me well uh, as I worked with some different teams where their backgrounds tended to be C and Java. And uh, so I was really able to stand out and provide a unique flavor to uh, software development. Uh, so I do come from uh, you know, defense contracting for, for many different customers uh, in the government space. Uh, most I can't say, but uh, what I can talk about is kind of the technologies that uh, I tended to work in. And so uh, one of the big things that I did was kind of back-end uh, data ingestion. So this is uh, ETL type problems where you're extracting from large, uh, large database systems, kind of massaging, transforming the data, and then sticking it in another database system for the purpose of analyzing that data. So I did a lot of, uh, um, a lot of applications and using Python filter uh, architectural styles to you know, take advantage of multiple processors and really uh, get a lot of throughput of data. Also did some link analysis. Uh, this is uh, basically evaluating uh, the uh, relationships between uh, nodes and network graph. Uh, so typically, in you know, the space that I tended to be in, these, these were social networks, so this is evaluating who knows who, how do they know them, why is that important, being able to analyze that. Did a lot of visualization tools, uh, work with um, in satellite animations of satellite, um, orbitology, um, and so got to do some OpenGL uh, types of stuff there. And finally, I went, uh, and this is kind of ironic because this was for a competing model of JWORDS, but we had a few spots on this contract. Uh, I went down to Air Force, uh, to the uh, Air Force Studies and Analysis, and uh, did a lot of uh, the Sun Grid engine, if anyone's heard of that. Uh, so using, they were running their simulations, and we would interact with uh, the SGE to actually submit these to uh, computers, basically, that were spread out all over the floor. They were the people, they were the computers that people would actually use. And so while they would work during the day, we would only steal one of their processors to run the jobs. But when they left after five, we would get their whole processor, all the processors. And so, and it was interesting there because I was first exposed to uh, Perl because uh, I had to work on Solaris systems. And if anyone knows anything about government contracting, if you want to use your favorite tools, you basically have to get them approved, which can take months. So typically, I just found myself looking on whatever machine they gave me and just looked, poking around and seeing what was available. So I just remember my first experience using the object-oriented facilities of Perl 5. Uh, they had a very interesting keyword called bless, which is how you create an object, you bless it. And so I thought that was kind of, Perl's got a lot of interesting characteristics too. So, and so finally, I came in uh, last May uh, joined instantiations, and kind of the first uh, task I was uh, assigned to do was code completion, so I was really excited about this because uh, this is an area I'd never really worked in. Um, and so let's talk about, you know, just in general, there, there are a few different use cases, but uh, basically, in, and in stand, standard engineering fashion, I, I took a look at John O'Keefe's slides and I took this one for myself, so uh, you'll probably see this in a different form a little later, but uh, as we all, we're all pretty familiar with code completion, so the idea is to, um, you can't recall, you know, can't just remember all these names exactly as they are. And so what we can do is use the uh, computer's abilities to calculate. Uh, we can use our abilities to uh, search, you know, in different ways to be able to, rec to see these names and kind of a pop-up list and select them. And I don't know how well you can see that graphic. looks pretty good, actually. Um, that's kind of the theme I choose uh, for mine. This is not the stock default theme, but as you can see, we have this whole theming and kind of match highlighting engine that can uh, stylize a lot of the uh, content that's in the pop-up. Just 
the quick uh, overview of the release history. This this is pretty new. Um, the code completion burst came in at eight five. And which was last August. And uh, the nice thing was, since I came on board in May, which is kind of midstream, um, the first thing I did was took a look at our, our community and VA primarily. And what was interesting was there were about four, you know, four pages of just content after content of what our user community wanted to see. And I thought that was very interesting because uh, that just told me, you know, that people had pretty strong feelings about, you know, what code completion, what the experience should be like. I really wanted to model it after, you know, kind of the union of what our user community wanted, as well as take my experiences both from the small talk, uh, you know, ID experience, as well as a lot of external ID experience, and kind of bring that together. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, was I mean, just lots and lots of research, uh, and by that I mean just crawling through forums, uh, bug, you know, bug requests or bug releases, and all these kinds of all these kinds of deals just to see what what the problems people had with current code completion. Uh, and this is both within small talk IDs as well as you know some of the big uh, the bigger ones were like NetBeans and Eclipse and Visual Studios and IntelliJ. Uh, then I looked in small talk, you know, Payro and, and VisualWorks and looked at all these all these things. And there's and everybody has, you know, their strong points in there and, and some really unique, they bring unique flavors. To them, and uh, so I kind of wanted to do our own thing, but kind of bring everything together as best we could, and see if we, if folks were coming from different environments, if we could find a way to have them be able to tweak it so they could be comfortable. And so I think A5, uh, when it came in, it was pretty good. Um, we definitely checked the box, and it was context sensitive code completion, and uh, it had some neat stylization. But I thought there was a lot. A lot more that I really wanted to do, and so in version 8.5.1, it's actually a, a kind of a major overhaul. You, I don't know if you'll really see it right off the bat, but there are a lot, a lot of new features. So we're going to look at our configuration UI. We've almost tripled our number of uh, features that are actually available for you to tweak. And the idea, the kind of design philosophy around it was that you know it's not expected that you open the product and the first thing you're supposed to do is go to the config. Know, a UI and start messing around with everything. It's really about hopefully you like the stock experience, but everybody likes something just a little bit different. So if that's the case, you know, hopefully we have exposed uh, some settings that allow you to make it the way that you'd like to see it. So I'd like to talk about uh, some of the features for 851, which is our current release. Uh, these are kind of the major, major features. First of all, we redesigned our configuration UI, and this is kind of necessary because we have so many more options. Uh, and before it was kind of a very simple key value, uh, you know, table, well, with, you know, 42 some odd options now, uh, that's not really appropriate to present them that way, so we've got a slightly different looking configuration UI. We also do uh, theme and match highlighting. So theming is just basically the idea that you can, you have control over the background, foreground colors, uh, for fonts, uh, match highlighting is about as you type. Um, it's able to partially stylize text that's showing up in the pop-up to show, you know, here's what you already typed, here's what remains to be typed. So you have control over, you know, colors and stylizations. We've got uh, camel case matching, which is my favorite feature. Uh, so, and we do it, we do it in a little different fashion. We offer actually four variants of an algorithm for, so there's two main camel case matching algorithms. And we're going to look at um, you know, some of the differences. Uh, the simple one, kind of the most strict form, is, is the kind that you can see in that page or Eclipse. Uh, but then we have um, another kind that's, that's I only be aware of one other IDE out there that does it this way, and that's IntelliJ, where uh, for camel case matching, you're not required to press the shift key or the uppercase character to do camel case matching. So we can do camel case matching all lowercase. Um, Live filtering, this is the concept of when the pop-up comes up, uh, we have special hotkeys that allow you to quickly filter. Uh, I only want to see public methods. I only want to see, you know, show me a hierarchy sort versus a lexiographical sort. Um, and it only lasts for as long as the pop-up is up. Once it goes away, it restores your original settings from the global configuration. We've got some light block argument detection. Uh, this is mostly based on a naming convention, but it does do some 
checking the senders and implementers to try to figure out if it's if this thing is a block. And the purpose of that is when you accept the completion, it will automatically insert blocks uh, in the arguments if it can detect that it is one. Uh, something that's new is pre-write changes ability. So if you're in a browser and uh, you're looking at a particular class that belongs to a particular application, uh, we can actually, kind of similar to you know in, in Java or whatnot, imports, uh, just kind of analyzing, you know, kind of publishing what's actually visible to you. Obviously, in a small talk system, you can reference whatever you want, but for the purposes of packaging, you, know, you kind of want to, you may just want to see what's visible on the chain server. So, I, just going back to the previous one about blocks, trying to visualize what it does, when it, man, it, it detects that you're matching a method that takes block arguments, and it does the code completion, it puts in empty blocks when you type the code in, is that? Yes, that's right. And we're gonna we're gonna see that and most of this. I'm trying to I'll breeze through the slides here, and then we're gonna we're gonna see um, yeah, most of this will be a demo, just kind of live. So we'll uh, we'll definitely take a look at that. Yeah. And it also takes a cursor and puts it in the first argument position inside that block, so you don't have to go very far. Uh, we've got drag and drop, which is uh, I've actually I actually end up using this a lot. I don't know how others will end up using it, but um, the suggestions basically become. Uh, you can drag them out and have you know, open browsers on them, either reference browsers or senders and connectors. And then we have some uh, a new completion type, which uh, we'll be talking about. So I wanted to kind of talk about the general design philosophy from kind of the principal design decisions or architecture. Uh, basically, we've got uh, Code Assist is built on a more generalized content assist framework. And so the idea of this was that, and, and this is some of the lessons I learned when I had to build uh, some applications on uh, the NetBeans and Code Assist client platforms, where their own IDE is built, you know, using their little modular system. But when I want to create uh, something for myself, I can grab some of their modules and use them. Uh, and you know, there's kind of a nice uh, they expose, you know, frameworks that you can inject, uh, you know, certain behavior into. Uh, and so I kind of used some of those lessons to build a more generalized, very you know, minimal dependencies, something that's injectable, um, and also you can extend it, which Codasys does, um, uh, to uh, you know, refine the behavior. So phase one was to you know, extend the framework um, to, for the first, first implementation, uh, which is Codasys. I've also got uh, one other much simpler implementation to show you if we have time, which is just a simple text editor that relies on the content assist framework to do autocomplete the same way that, say, Microsoft Word would do it. If you were you know, typing in just a few characters, it, it remembers what you already typed, what words, and so it would show those to you. And so that's a very simple one if you want to see how the framework work, you know, how that works. Uh, it's very simple. Just some of the future phases is to, uh, we want to add additional code assist features. So kind of we're using the two words interchangeably at the moment, code assist and code completion, but we actually, the IE offers lots of other code assist features already, such as uh, syntax color highlighting, and you know, that's all under the code assist domain. So we want to kind of unify and uh, add additional features down the road. So that's the point of the, the framework. So I just wanted to real quickly go over what I call the, you know, the actors, the, the kind of the main players in, in code completion. And this, this is talking about it from kind of the general framework uh, point of view. We have a code assistant, which is kind of the, the guy that everybody's hooked into, and he, he kind of controls the main workflow um, for the various other actors. We've got what's called the context. So in code, uh, kind of in code assist speak, that would be to think of the context as being a workspace, a browser, or a debugger. Each one can offer potentially you know, different information. Um, We've got a provider that is, uh, you know, this is the thing that actually provides the suggestions. And so right now we have a small talk provider, but uh, <coughs> there's no reason, say, you wanted to create an XML editor um, and you wanted an XML provider, uh, then you can, you can have that be separate. Mm -hmm. uh, create an XML provider and as you type a certain token, it's looking at it from the perspective of trying to complete an XML tag. Uh, so, and then we have suggestions. These are the renderable, you know, items that you see in the pop-up, and 
uh, once you, I mean, really from the framework standpoint, if you accept a suggestion, you could do anything. Just so happens your code completion, what it does is complete uh, whatever the partial word is that was next to the first word. Uh, finally, we have kind of our more you know, visual and, and upper level kind of uh, actors. And so we have the text widget, just this notion of a text widget, which is this, you know, kind of use a bridge uh, abstraction. So what's sitting underneath the text widget is typically right now like one of our native uh, text editor widgets, but it wouldn't have to be. You could actually put a combo box under there or whatever you would want, you know, something that has a string in it that you may want to have a pop-up come up next to a cursor. Uh, so it'd be pretty pretty easy to do that. Uh, the pop-up is a, it's another bridge abstraction. We actually use this because we have multiple flavors of pop-up. You can use our native list, uh, the native list widget of the operating system, or you can use our extended widgets, which gives us more control to do things like match highlighting, uh, things like that. And finally, we have kind of the concept of session is what I like. I didn't know how it would go in the very beginning, but it's turned out to be extremely useful uh, abstraction. Uh, basically, as the pop-up comes up, you can think that a session is, has started. And so as you continue to type, the session's tracking the state. And so we're able to do some very interesting things. So while the pop-up is up, we can do a lot of caching at the session level. We can also do it for a particular character that you press. Uh, we can cache at that level. Uh, and once the, you know, once you accept a suggestion or you cancel out, uh, the session is closed. So right now, code completion is available in, in three basic contexts. So the browsers and the debuggers and the workspaces. Each offers you know, a little bit more uh, information. So uh, the most static form is the browsers. Uh, so they have, uh, you know, the browsers basically, if you were trying to resolve a variable, say you had X, and you were to request code completion on that, you know, doesn't, there's not a lot of information there to, to be able to determine what X is. So, uh, you know, you kind of get, you get the most limited behavior. Uh, in workspaces, though, you know, when you evaluate a particular variable in some of our workspaces, uh, it actually caches uh, that variable in the background of the workspace. And so it can actually, Codasys can use that information the next time you evaluate you know, that cached variable, say, oh, well, I don't need to try to figure out what this is. I know what it is because you just evaluated it and I'm hanging on to that. In debuggers, it's kind of similar. So we have, you know, in a debugger, you may have your variables and you have your, you know, your locals and your temps. And so and in a, you know exactly what they are because you know, it's, it's debugging and you get all that information from the debugger. So code, code completion hooks into that. So these are some of our suggestion types. I'm actually going to, when we go to the live demo, we're gonna, we're just gonna look at these, so I don't need to go through all of them. But uh, the last one's kind of interesting. It sounds kind of dumb. At first, I was, you know, I figured this name wasn't really amenable to a PowerPoint slide because the idea of completing a character literal is, you know, it's like, no, it's not about helping you, you know, complete the letter A. This is, uh, this is about uh, trying to present, to do something interesting for character literals, which I think was pretty cool. Um, basically, we offer the suggestion pop-up that shows the non-extended uh, ASCII reference. So, uh, and maybe you can do some interesting searches if you don't remember the particular ASCII value or uh, some other interesting things, so I'll be showing that. Finally, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about uh, some of the session management, or I'm gonna show that, really. Uh, and what I'll say for right now is there's, for performance, Reasons. There's there's four basic functions. There's the initial query, uh, where you, you, know, you, you ask for a completion on a particular partial string, and then it tries to figure out what it is and does all this work. And so, and then it presents you here's what it, you know here's the list of options. Well, as you refine down that search, you press an additional character. You just need to filter down on that existing list. You don't need to try to refigure things out again. So that's filtering. And then we, because it is tracking states, if you were to kind of back up, press the backspace key or go back to a state of which it's already, it already knows what it is, uh, that's called restoring the state. And so this is all kind of seamless. You don't really get a sense of this when you're actually typing out. But this is one of the reasons that it's so fast. 
Uh, and so it also, the session also allows us to do a lot of caching. Uh, we'll see for match highlighting, it's, it's uh, pretty valuable, as well as the tell live filtering is able to so seamlessly you can change all the configuration options, do hotkeys, and then once the session goes away, you know, everything's back to normal. So all I wanted to say was, uh, you know, about this was, you know, under serious time constraints, so pretty, pretty, uh, you know, I'm looking at 80 to 150 milliseconds to try to do all of this work, uh, and it's a lot, and um, so, one of the things I'm looking forward to in the future is being able to, you know, once you open a browser, uh, maybe taking a few seconds, you know, five seconds or so to try to figure out, you know, additional things. Now I can start, you know, following paths and flow. Um, just things that I can't possibly do in, in this amount of time. And so because this is so constrained, I mean, such a big constraint, you know, everything uh, has been heavily optimized from the drawing to the, you know, to try the, the matching and all the it's very, it's just such a limited time frame that, um, I mean, there's just a lot that goes on. And so if you gave me five, in fact, somebody said, you have five seconds, you know, in the beginning when you open up to do something, that to me, that's like, that's like a lifetime. There's so much that could be done. Um, okay, so let's, let's get to it. I think this is, you know, the, the slides are interesting, but I think that actually showing, uh, showing some of this stuff is what's actually cool. So. The first thing I want to go over is kind of our, our revamped uh, configuration UI. The first thing you notice here is, you know, try to be respectful of everybody's, you know, how everybody wants to use code assist, and that includes not wanting to use it at all. So the, the most obvious option first is turn it off. You know, if, you, if this is not your thing, uh, we provide a very easy option for you to disable it. And so once you bring up the edit, uh, we can edit the code assist settings. So you see this kind of, <coughs> see this kind of uh, key value list here, and it's, uh, filled, it's kind of grouped. So it's grouped in terms of, you can see them all, we've got look and feel settings, we've got basic settings. Basic settings are kind of, if you went around to all the different uh, IEEs and kind of tried to create an applied standard, the basic settings would probably capture that for the course, course rating standards. And then we have some advanced settings, which are very fine-grained tweaks for those who wanted you know, to do specialized things. And so the first thing uh, to notice is, you know, we have, right now we have this concept of a, a feature, and this is for future kind of unification goals. Uh, right now, the, the feature is code completion, that's what we have. Um, and we've seen the filters. And the other thing, nice thing about filtering is that if you want to restore everything to back to its default, uh, you notice the button at the bottom left that says restore all defaults. Well, let's say you just messed around with your look and feel, but you've already tweaked your your basic and advanced settings to something you like, but you just want to mess with the look and feel and you screwed it up and now you want it back to the default, well, this will just restore uh, your look and feel settings, leaving your other settings alone. And then, you know, some of these, it's hard to capture the intent in, in about, you know, four or five words. So uh, what we did is, well, there is documentation, so you can certainly go to that and get a sense of what all these options do, because there are a lot. But you can also, if you kind of want to get the gist, well, we added uh, tooltips over the, if you hover over a particular option name, it can kind of get a quick sense of what these do. And so um, the final part about the, the UI is that we've got these key bindings that kind of give you a summary of all the hotkeys. And again, you can go to the documentation to kind of get a sense, but I really wanted it front and center so you didn't have to go very far. And so this is kind of dynamically generated because you depending on what your settings are, these keys may read differently. But uh, this, this shows you what you know, the hotkeys are, it shows you uh, how to accept your completion, how to uh, actually activate uh, code completion. So the first thing, uh, let's just go through some of the look and feel, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you guys through some of, uh, we're gonna do some actual, uh, just some scenarios that uh, we'll look at. Uh, so if I bring up, um, let me just bring up a workspace here, and we'll just quickly take a look at you know, what this is. Now, you see the background is blue, and that's because it's set up to be default, and so it's using my default uh, colors for my browser. For my browser. So take a look at this. You can see I use a blue one, and so that's what it's actually going to do. And so 
Right now we see kind of the first three are these pseudo variables. Uh, we don't really have any uh, locals at the moment, but we can change that. Uh, and so those will come up first, followed by your pseudos. Followed by we have you know, a bunch of classes. Uh, and even though applications are classes, uh, apps and sub apps, we actually sort those after. Uh, we want to do that because this, this just found these aren't typically referenced in code. You're not typically typing these out. Uh, but the, um, they're still, I mean, obviously they should still be in there, but we just kind of lower their, their sort priority a little bit. Uh, finally, we have, you, know, you see a bunch of pool, these are a bunch of pool variables. Uh, we have uh, pool dictionaries. Um, and so that, that's that basic context. This is basically the non-method context if you're entering a class name or whatnot. Uh, so if we, if we enter a class name, let's say uh, ordered collection, and we take a look at uh, some of the methods. Uh, so here, it knew, it knew exactly what order collection was, so we get this kind of this hierarchy sort, where it's first showing you know, everything from order collection on up the super chain class. Now I can use that live filtering if I just press Control Shift H, and I can change it real quickly to the Alexia graphical sort. Um, and I can also, you know, if I don't like those private methods there, and sort of interested in public, I can do a Control Shift P. And so this remains active. These, these policies that I'm switching around are active for as long as code assist is actually up. But once I shut it down and I bring it back, I get kind of whatever my global configuration says it should be. And so these are the method, uh, method suggestions. So what we kind of see is, um, first of all, the name is too long for the display. We're, we're working on a very kind of limited display. Usually I'm, I'm at 1080p and you know, people generally have larger resolution usually a little more screen real estate, but you can see here the dot, 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 that there's a lot of formatting that goes on uh, to try to fit things in. Um, so on the right side, you're kind of seeing the description of what this is, and on the left side, you see you know, the actual method name, and it's uh, you know, is it public or it's private. And so some of the, as far as the look and feel goes, I mean, some of the things you can do, if you're kind of the, uh, you're of the mind that you like real basic. Uh, you're not really interested in the icons and the color of the match highlight. You still want to use code completion, but you're just not interested in all that. Um, what we can do is we can give you kind of the basic uh, list widgets. Uh, that's just you know it's just very basic, very simple. Uh, but this may be your thing, you know. So you may just just there's not a whole lot to it. You lose a lot of you saw a lot of those options disappear because you. Quite frankly, we just don't have the same amount of control over uh, the native list widget of the operating system. And so you can, however, uh, still do some things, such as uh, changing the background, the foreground color. You can change the text. Uh, and you can also size, you know, up and you can still size up and down the number of suggestions. Um, so you have a pretty sophisticated uh, layout policy up in the general framework. Uh, so you'll notice here, if, uh, let's see how, what 20 gets us. So that's gonna wanna show under, but suppose you know your way down here, uh, and then it's gonna figure out the constraints of the screen. Here it's gonna show, show above. And so the, another, uh, another tweak you might wanna make, this is really minor, but it was really trivial to expose, uh, was you'll notice that the pop-up tends to align with the with the text and it kind of stays put, and tries to align itself with the partial text. Uh, if you kind of wanted to move along, you know, uh, like some IDs have, um, we certainly have that. It, it was you know, trivial to do so, um, and it's just a slight visual tweak, as most of these are. Uh, but again, it's a it's a complete experience that you're building. So each one by itself is you know, not really uh, always that significant. So let's go ahead and go back to the default since I happen to be using enhanced list widget product then so will the, the pop-up will be the enhanced list widget form <coughs> and so now we're coming back to the original and what we'll notice is that um, you can really uh, you can really tweak out I mean, as we saw on, on one of the other slides the way I tend to use a very minimalistic theme that's built from Google Chrome uh, so URL if you start typing in a URL and pops down with some suggestions, they're kind of green and then bolded on certain areas. And I kind of designed mine to be like that. 
Uh, the default styling, I, I wanted to keep conservative. Uh, so the way that it works is if you have, you know, we're typing in order to collection, um, I should probably change the background color because you can't really see the stylization. So let's just do, uh, let's do white. And because I changed the background, the foreground color uh, is the default and it automatically computed the inverse of the background color. So now that's going to be black. Uh, so you can kind of see, let's see if you can see it well. I think so. At the beginning there, I'm typing ORD. And on the, at least on the selected portion, you see a little bit of style, stylization there. Um, it's very subtle. Uh, I didn't want to have you know the whole the pop up as a whole, you know, being you know, all these colors and all over the place. But you can do it, uh, and that's typically the way that I have it. I just didn't want to impose that on people, but I did want to you know let folks know that there is that stylization is available, and it's kind of cool. Um, kind of adds to that modern you know, that modern feel. Um, so before we talk about some of these others, let's go ahead. I'd like to explain kind of the kind of what I think is, is the most significant feature uh, in the 851 uh, product, and uh, and this had, the stylization will will play a role in this in order to show it off. Uh, so this is the camel case uh, matching policy, and so what happens here is that if you guys are familiar with uh, you know using that beams or clips and using the camel case. Uh, matching, you'll know that you'll be kind of used to this idea. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is I'm going to say for a camel case match policy, I'm going to kind of take you through these settings. Again, there's a there's a, a tool tip to describe this, but it's really hard to describe in you know, five words or less. But very strict is very close to uh, the way you would see it in say an F-Games or an Eclipse. Uh, the idea is let's say we want to complete a uh, read-write stream. Uh, so one way we could do that is, you know, first of all, let's just type this out. What we see is that, you know, there's really three words that have been shoved together, as we all know, uh, and kind of the, what we call the camel humps, which are those two capital letters in this. We can use that to actually as our partial string and actually real quickly get to those matches. So in very strict, it says that you must use uppercase characters uh, to denote the camel humps in the name. and all the number of parts must, must, must match. So in this case, we have three total parts, read, write, stream. It's got to be uppercase to match these. So you see there's read, write, stream. And now what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to really show off the, uh, to allow you to really see this easier, uh, the actual matching. So what I'm going to do is, what it, it typically makes you know, one contiguous matching region and one you know, unmatched region. What we can do is we can switch this, highlight the stink match regions, and set this to true. I'm also going to set the uh, region color for, for what's matched to red. Uh, and so you also can stylize separately you know, the, the item that's selected, what, you know, what color that looks like. So I'm going to set both of those to red, and I'm also going to take the font for the stuff that matches, and not only bold it, but just make it slightly bigger. So if we go back over here, let's see what that produces. All right, so we see kind of, first of all, the first thing you notice is I just type three characters and we only have one suggestion. So we can real quickly uh, get to what we want. Uh, order collection. Uh, okay, so that, that created a few more, but it's pretty easy to just add a few extra characters uh, and get to it. Um, so this is, this is pretty useful. Um, this is really, you know, the nice thing about camel case matching is it kind of, uh, you know, it encourages you, well, uh, so you don't, you're not penalized for creating longer, more descriptive things. In fact, the longer, kind of the better, because, you know, a, you know, very, would kind of just be a very long. Just get to it. You just get to it quicker. I did that correctly. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that, that's right. Because the number of parts must match. It's a very strict one. It, it keeps it keeps stuff tight. But uh, generally, I like to kind of see some of the other options that are in there. So I don't want the number of parts to necessarily match. So let me show you what you know people might want if they want that you know more strict algorithm. Uh, so you want something more like that, where the number of parts doesn't necessarily have to match. Um, so you, you 
I think you can kind of get a sense for how this algorithm is sort of working. So these are, that's the difference between very strict and strict. Uh, they both require the capital letters to denote the camel humps in the name, but uh, in one case, the total parts must match and the other it doesn't have to. Uh, this, is the, this is a completely different algorithm. It's much more uh, ambiguous uh, to, and you know, it requires a much uh, more sophisticated algorithm to do this. Um, so for read, write, stream, you can just type, let's go ahead and you kind of get the idea of lenient would be the number of parts must match, and then very lenient is um, they don't have to match. In both cases, we don't have to press capital letters any longer. So read, write, stream. There you go. Uh, so you can now quickly uh, you know, get to you know, very, very quickly you know, start completing things. Um, so a very long string, a very long um, so things become much shorter. So we have that we have that going for classes and uh, you know for for logos and all that. But I wanted to do something for methods, and which is kind of you know if you think about it, so we'll take add you know after index. Now how can we make this fit with the camel case algorithm that we came up with? Well, what what we did is we said, well, let's go ahead. I wanted to make sure that pressing the colon was optional because the whole idea is to take you from having to press the shift key. So I said, let's let's create a kind of a fuzzy algorithm that the you can put the uh, colon in if you want, but you don't have to. And then in order to make it work, we just artificially promote every letter that in the selector name that comes after the colon to the uppercase variant. So we kind of pass in this modified form and it actually fits very nicely with the algorithm. So as an example, you know, order collection new, and so I want to do add after and then. And so it's all kind of natural, and uh, it kind of fits with the way that you tend to recall the names. Um, and as I said, you can put, uh, you, you can see how that's matching, and the, the colon kind of becomes a kind of a clean star before the colon, as it kind of matches up to the colon. Um, and so you don't have to have it in there, but you can. Um, and it just becomes very, very easy and natural over time. And this is the way that I, I typically use it today. And it takes, it, it saves just a whole lot of time. So let me just go over uh, some of these. Um, I'd like to show you some of the kind of the lower level algorithm stuff. Uh, let's take a look at uh, some assignment tracking. So we have, let's do this. Let's do x equals uh, word collection. Uh, new. We'll say y equals x, and then we'll say z equals y. So what should z be? Well, we, we can see and we know that it should be an order collection instance. Well, so it is able to also uh, keep track of assignments and understand that that's what it is. And again, so it's nice, clean, uh, and this is an option. You don't have to have it do a hierarchy sort. But if it, can, if it knows exactly what it is, then it can do this hierarchy sort, and you can quickly filter down and say, oh, I don't want to see, you know, uh, I only want to see public methods. I don't want to see methods that have object in it. And so now you can kind of quickly get down to this very nice list that you can begin doing some API browsing on. I uh, wanted to show you some conditional assignments. Uh, so this is the idea that if I set x equals 3, and then I consider Boolean expression b, and I said, you know, if that's true, now x equals a string. So now the question is, what is x? And so the answer is, well, it's either a small integer or it's a string. We don't actually know until it actually B gets evaluated. And so what it kind of creates is this um, aggregate type of both an integer and a string. And so you still get, uh, you still get to, you know, access to all the methods. And of course, you see a lot of object methods which are really easy to get rid of. Uh, it, that's not your thing. And uh, so there it is. And so we also, um, but it even has some more interesting code path uh, following abilities. We've got these things called logical assignments, where even though control, um, control flow structures aren't officially part of the language, uh, let's say we consider uh, Boolean expression B, uh, if true, I'll do the camel case mention here, if true, if false. This goes back to that gentleman who just asked about uh, uh, the, you can see here that it, it could detect that those were blocks and so it's actually inserted those um, and placed the cursor inside the first argument block there. 
And so if we have this, um, and let's say, let's even go a little bit further. Inside there, we have another one. We say x equals uh, a string. And then in this path, x equals you know, another string. And we go down here, if false, uh, and then Boolean expression B is true if false, x equals. So I'm just making sure all paths are covered. So if we look at what does that what is x? Knows x is a string. That's because all paths here are covered. Uh, now if, if I were to take this out, now notion of code. It just knows tokens as strings. Uh, so if we take here, it's not able to follow right string. It doesn't know what the return value of that is. And so what we can do though is say, well, let's start using this thing. So I'll do a next put all um, a string uh, followed by, you know, space followed by next, you know, followed by contents or whatnot. Now let's take a look at what it thinks string is. So let's get rid of object. And we can see it's pretty much, it's pretty much figured it out. This thing is a string of some sort. Um, so you, know, you can see in there that um, you know, positionable string, read write string. So just fuck with a few methods in this, in this particular area, it actually knows what it is. <coughs> so that's the whole type reconstruction. Uh, we actually have some, um, some call it cheating, uh, we call it heuristic analysis, uh, where it's uh, you know, using naming conventions. And, and it's very pragmatic to do this because, you know, uh, this all, it all kind of connects together uh, sooner or later. When I'll, I'll kind of show you a quick example. But let's take as story collection. Well, it doesn't really follow the path of that. But what it does is say, well, it's, it's as and then it's something. And is that something up in the, you know, is that a class name? And if so, you know, let's, you know, let's make that, and I know what that is. We'll make this. And so finally, uh, we'll just do a couple more here before I gotta, I got to cut it off. Um, you know, all satisfy. Well, that'd be hard to figure out what that is. But that whole expression it knows is a little. This is just based on some heuristic, heuristic things. So I think uh, I'm out of time. Is that correct? Yes. So anyway, thank you. If you want to see the general framework, I